Today is Monday, January 27th, 2020. I'm going to begin by reviewing the agenda. Uh, we're going to go through announcements and, as I said, review the agenda. There'll be a public comment period thereafter where members of the public, if they have questions, can come to the microphone and ask us what their questions might be. Uh, that'll be followed by the Tom Manager's Report, which will include our agenda schedule moving forward. Consider approving an amendment to the Committee Vacancy Policy. Approve letter or support to the uh, Division of Conservation and Recreation for the Squanicook River Rail Trail Project. Approve a request at the Neshoba Chamber of Commerce for a one-day all-liquor alcohol license uh, for the annual uh, Neshoba Taste of Neshoba event to be held on Tuesday, March 24th, 2020 at Lawrence Academy from 5.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Then we will consider ratifying the appointment of Emily Nevada, Virginia Relknapp, Michael Leturs, and Carrie Bolton as election workers, followed by FY 22nd quarter financial update, review of the select board annual goals, an executive session minute review update, and the FY 21 budget update. At 7.15, the town manager's uh, report will be interrupted uh, by a presentation from the assessors on the available property tax exemptions. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss any other business that we may have, and then we have a list of ongoing issues which the town manager will update us on, followed by one set of minutes from our regularly scheduled meeting of January 13th, 2020. Under announcements before anybody else has one, I've got one, um, and I'd be remiss to mention that uh, Al Wyatt, a lifelong Grottonian, uh, 84 years old, passed away last week. Oh, sorry. And um, I had the pleasure of knowing Al for over 20 years and working with him, uh, redoing the Williams Barn, and not just his woodworking skills, uh, but his old frugal Yankee mentality and sense of humor was just so refreshing and he was so enjoyable to talk with and just his craftsmanship and his work both at the barn and on the restoration of wagons and whatnot. And Al is, or well, was, one of a kind and along with his brother Tom who's passed, Bayard Underwood who's no longer with us, Bruce Clements, Vic Burton, all five of them and then there's me. And I'm the only one that's really left that worked on the Williams Barn Project. And it's amazing how many years have gone by, but they're all gone. So the town will miss Al, and I uh, just wanted to mention his passing. There will be um, a, whether it's a wake or a memorial service at Badger Funeral Home next Saturday. So if you want to see the calling hours, check that out and uh, pay your respects if you knew him. Anybody have any other announcements? I have two. Okay. Uh, one I want to update on an agenda item. When I gave my town manager's report on the upcoming uh, agendas and meeting schedules, I had tonight designated for a meeting with the CPA to discuss the future of the CPA. Um, I didn't realize that that was the same night that the CPC is holding their annual uh, public hearing on the proposals for this coming uh, the FY21 projects, which is going on right now as we speak. So we have scheduled that meeting for next Monday the Community Preservation Committee will be here at that time. Uh, in addition to that, the Groton Garden Club, in conjunction with the Nashua River Water Service Watershed Association, is presenting a seminar called Trust Fund Lecture 2020. Toby Wolf, who is a Groton resident and a local landscape architect, will lead the discussion. Uh, it will be held at the Groton Center, 163 West Main Street, on Sunday, February 9th from two to four, the snow date will be Sunday, February 16th. It's free and it's open to the public and it's made possible by a grant from the Groton Commissioners of the Trust Lecture Fund. So I encourage anyone interested in that to go uh, Sunday, February 9th from two to four at the Groton Center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will relinquish my chairmanship and turn it back over to the chair who has just arrived. Okay, then you have to tell me where we're at. We're at public comment period. That's it. Great. Does anyone in the public have any comments? <laughs> All right, not seeing any, then we will move on to the town manager's report. I'm gonna take the first thing um, out of order. I'm gonna ask Mr. Cunningham to come to the uh, table. And I would ask the board members to go to page six of your packet. Uh, Peter has been working uh, very hard for the last couple of years on the 
uh, National River Rail Trail extension. Uh, they've already started it. They're going for another round of funding, and he's here to request that the board uh, give another uh, letter of support. So, great. Well, great. Uh, thank you for your time and your agenda this evening. And a couple of corrections. It's been more than a couple of years. It's probably been like uh, uh, 16 years we've been working on this project. This is the Squanicook River Rail Trail, which is going to run from Townsend to, oh, to West you. Groton, not the National River Rail Trail. So uh, we've been working on it for a number of years, and uh, we've actually made some progress. It's all permitted now, uh, and uh, we've actually done some work on it. The corridor right now has been cleared. We had a, uh, a firm out there that uh, did the clearing uh, a couple of weeks ago. So the whole corridor from Townsend Center to, to Bertozzi is now cleared uh, 25 foot. So all the scrub growth that have gone up is cleared. Uh, we'll be moving forward in the next uh, couple of years in terms of our construction with uh, removing of the rails and the ties and, and laying down a, a stone dust base. Um, one of the funding mechanisms we use for this are the trails grants that are available through uh, DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. And uh, we've received grants in the past from DCR and we're applying again this year for uh, grants. And as part of that process, we're seeking letters of recommendations from the uh, you know, area boards, both here and in Townsend, uh, amongst uh, others too, uh, as part of the application process. So the letter that is before you is one that we've uh, uh, drafted and put together to go to the uh, DCR commissioner uh, to seek their support for uh, our application and our grant application. Just one question. Sure. It wasn't a, totally clear to me. Squanicook Greenways, is that an actual like organization? It is, yes. It's the 501C3 that's been put together to, to develop the trail. Okay. And we actually were the only nonprofit that's actually negotiated a lease with the MBTA to do a trail development. Most uh, leases that are negotiated with the MBTA are with municipalities or with the state to develop rail trails. So we're the only nonprofit that's done that. Is that because? This trail traverses two different towns, or? Well, no, more was uh, back in the earlier um, stages of trying to work on this project, we were actually hoping to get the state and DCR to go ahead and, and do a trail. Um, their response was that there already was a trail in this area and they wanted to develop trails elsewhere, so they weren't really going to take that one on. So we then started working um, within MassDOT and, and a number of other agencies to try to find a way around that. And uh, we came up with this approach where we created a nonprofit and applied directly for the lease, and that was granted. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that I applaud Peter's tenacity and, and the rest of your group's tenacity, uh, persistence as well, uh, because as you pointed yep. out, I remember 15 plus years ago when you first brought this up, right. and there was a lot of issues with the MBTA obtaining the, the right way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've worked very hard and for a very long time on this, and I think it'll be a great asset to not just our communities, but all the way up into New Hampshire, where ultimately it'll tie in, if my recollection Correct. is right. Correct. And going in the other direction, you can go down to the air, uh, down behind uh, Town Forest, across the Trestle Bridge, and down to air and, and be where the, or close to where the National River Rail Trail starts. So. That's a real potential. So I wholeheartedly support this. Yeah. John. I'm struggling a little bit on the last sentence. Okay. I don't have any problem with it, except it's it's like we fully support the Squanicook Greenway application. Yeah. Um, but it says on the one I'm looking at, it talks about your application. That's so, I called Dawn earlier today and I said, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sure it must be supposed to say Squanicook Greenway's application. Right. The actual document that uh, is here it does Allison here on says, the screen. Uh, Squanicook yeah. Greenway, so I'm all set. Yeah. Right, yeah, we're, we're the, we're, we in fact are the applicants. So the yeah, forms that's and. That's why this didn't read, the way it was when I first saw it didn't work for me. It oh, it's been changed, okay. it's been corrected. It up, so I'm fine. Okay. Oh, we correct. Instead, yes, we talked with our uh, grant application writer, and, yep. and we felt it needed to go directly to the uh, commissioner Montgomery. Yep. And is this? I apologize if this was already. No, that's fine. Is this a, a grant to fund construction? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, um, yes, construction of the trail. Correct. Okay. So we, we've done. We have done. There's a combination of funds we're using. There's fundraising that's been done. 
And then we've used uh, DCR trail grants to do that. Uh, in fact, if you go out there right now and visit the corridor, which I would encourage folks to do if you get a chance, you'll see that it's actually been cleared. Uh, and that was money, part of that was trails grant money, part of that was money that we had uh, raised uh, through private fundraising. Okay, and is this grant, or with this grant, is there enough funding kind of secured and figured out to finish the project, or is this? Yeah, we're looking at a, a, a stage of development probably over two years, so okay. grant cycles are one-year cycles, so we can apply again. The Mass Trails Grant, uh, the whole program has received additional funding, so there's more money available now for trails. Uh, there's another trail in town, in fact, you're probably familiar in Harry Rich State Forest, the John Tinker Trail. Uh, that also was a trail that was uh, where they used uh, Mass DCR Trails Grant to develop that. So there's more money for trails uh, now coming down through the state. So obviously getting this grant would be very beneficial. Correct. But it sounds like the project is, is such that it's gonna go forward kind of regardless. I mean, this isn't, we're not gonna get a grant, spend some money, and then be unable to complete it, or what have you, it's gonna. Correct, I mean, we, we will, this is one grant cycle. Uh, yeah. We would probably apply in subsequent grant cycles. Uh, our original model for actually doing the trail, a lot of it depended upon the, uh, the salvage value of the rails that was pulled up. Um, because of the market and what's happened with the, with the price of steel and the, and the salvage value of steel now has gone down. So we're now looking at a, a more, uh, I think, protracted construction schedule, whereas before we had hoped to do it in one year, but now it's going to take a little bit longer than that. Okay. But we've been at it for 16 years, and uh, we'll, we'll keep at it. Okay. And then probably my final question. Yeah. Once it's all completed, what is the maintenance kind of upkeep portion of that? Who's responsible for that? Squanico Greenways okay. is a nonprofit, and that's stipulated okay. in our lease. There's a lot of information, in fact, I'll, I'll plug our website, quantumcookgreenways.org. A lot of our documents are in there, so our, okay. our lease with the MBTA is there, so there's more information if you want to, you know, dig down into it and check that out. Okay, thank you, John. So as I understood your answer to Allison's question, it will be necessary for you to acquire after this grant is given to us additional grant or grants to complete the whole project. Yeah, correct. And in fact, this is, we, we've already applied for and received grant funding. So we've already received money from the uh, Mass DCR Trails Grant Program. So we'll apply again and, and, you know, perhaps the year after that apply again too. But it, there also is other sources of money. The Community Foundation of North Central Massachusetts has uh, dedicated some money to us. Uh, and we've done some private fundraising yeah, too. But those would be grants or donations or, or whatever, right? Uh, correct. Donations or, or grants in kind. Yeah. So That's it's right. Take more than this grant that right. we're recommending or asking them to uh, that we're supporting to finish the project. Yeah. Plus, they've received grant money in the past through the same organization. So this is they know about it, and hopefully right. they will continue to support the funding of the right. project. Yeah. yeah. But uh, may I follow yeah. up on the maintenance question on, on the Natural River Rail Trail? Doesn't the state um, come through and do significant repairs or upgrades? Uh, this, this is great. Um, I, lo I love to talk about trails. <coughs> I'm actually also a member of the Friends of the Natural River Rail Trail. But, um, you're correct, DCR is responsible for maintenance of the trail, uh, but they really do very, very little maintenance on the trail. So uh, our group, our Friends of the Natural River Rail Trail, has entered into a formal agreement with DCR to help with some of the maintenance. Uh, as part of that process, we've all undergone uh, chainsaw training. I'm now certified to operate a chainsaw in a, in a safe manner and uh, a number smart. of other things. We do sweep uh, the trail once a year with uh, blowers and stuff. We provide spot maintenance. All the big major stuff, of course, is something they need to do. Um, at some point in the future, I'll probably be returning to this board to look for support. Uh, we're trying to get DCR to actually reconstruct that trail. And typically the life of uh, paved rail trails is 15 to 20 years where they need to go out and be reconstructed, which has happened elsewhere in the state, down on the uh, Cape Cod Rail Trail that was rebuilt, uh, the Nawadic Trail out in uh, Western Mass, Northampton to Amherst. So they typically rebuild these things, but you need to you know, apply some pressure to make that happen. Will, will the maintenance situation be the same for the Squanic River? Well, it won't be DCR's responsibility, it'll be uh, Squanic Greenway, so we'll, we'll be responsible for doing that. Uh -huh. Right. So they won't? have any responsibility, DCR? No, DCR won't, no. This is I our see. project, not theirs. Okay. 
And I thought this was going to be the easiest thing on the agenda yeah, tonight. Right. <laughs> I moved Do you want to talk uh, even some more about trails? I moved that the select board uh, <clears throat> authorize the chair to sign the letter of support uh, for the Squanicook Greenways application for a DCR trails grant. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Peter, do you want the Excellent. letter? Do you want us to mail it? Uh, well, if you could mail it and maybe send me a PDF copy Perfect. of it, I'd love that'd be great. Um, it's 7:15. Right, thank um, you, folks. Thank you. So Thanks, I would like Peter. to uh, yep. invite the assessor, uh, Jonathan Greeno, to come up. Uh, I'd ask you to go to your packet page uh, 17, where Jonathan has outlined some of the exemptions. You here to give a brief presentation on those for the public's uh, information. And I will now stop talking and turn it over to Jonathan. I was given two minutes. Uh, 20 seconds, I believe. Oh, was. that's <laughs> um, Well, I just want to say thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, every fall, I try to get in front of, uh, with Kathy Shelp's help, um, a luncheon that they have at the Senior Center to go over a lot of this stuff. So I think by having it here, Maybe this can be an annual tradition where I come in in January and um, give this brief presentation because the uh, the deadline goes all the way to April 1st. So, this so this is, is different than a regular property tax abatement. This is to file for an exemption that will be on the fourth quarter tax bill? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's several ways for people to, uh, to file for uh, the state's property uh, tax exemption. Uh, one is uh, we have, they're separated into clauses. So clause 17D is surviving spouse, minor child of a deceased parent uh, or an elderly person. And what they say, I don't make these words up, they say elderly person and it's 70 years or older. Okay? Yep. This well, 17 is not on here, so I got confused. I'm sorry. Seven, that's veterans. All right, just to start there, I'll go with the veterans. Yeah, that's easy enough. All right, so the, the first uh, clause is uh, 22. It goes 22 A, B, C, D, E uh, in paraplegic. So it's a veterans exemption, and it's not a, it's a, it's a disabled veterans exemption, not a veterans exemption. So um, you have to be uh, deemed at least 10% di disabled by the uh, Veterans Administration. And so the, the, uh, the differences range from, um, well, the state allows us $400. However, out of the kindness of the taxpayers in this town, I think for 20 some odd years now, they have, dis uh, by local option, have decided to double the exemptions. So every exemption that the state offers, the town of Groton doubles it. Can we put that on the warrant and the consent agenda each yes. spring? Yeah. So um, the, the uh, veterans exemptions go from uh, $800 to about $2,500, depending on uh, the disability. So, uh, and, and basically, uh, the, the veteran would have a uh, letter from the VA stating exactly what the, the, uh, the percentage of their disability is. They bring that into us uh, and file for this every single year. So these, all of these exemptions have to be filed every year. If their exemption uh, percentage changes, they bring us a new form and it may or may not affect their uh, exemption. So uh, that's the veterans, disabled veterans exemption. That's the next one. And just to make sure that I'm, an, an exemption is you never pay that. Correct. An abatement would be pay it at some point? Or no, an, a, a, an abatement is for overvaluation or you can get in, there's two abatements you can get for overvaluation of your property or you can get an abatement of your uh, taxes for uh, CPA if you qualify. So, so okay. there's a CPA exemption, uh, abatement. And, and but, but they, uh, the real estate abatements can only be applied uh, for in a, just one month, January 1st, basically to February 1st. Jonathan, I messed up. When you what? gave me the, the packet of information, I gave one to Don. I 
left the rest, so you're gonna have to wing it on your own. And that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's. I that's apologize. Good. My error. That's all. That's all right. But to, to just continue. So an abatement you have to apply for every year. Yeah. Well, an abatement you you would let's say you wanted to you thought your your valuation of your home was too high, mm -hmm. then you would file for an abatement. Not necessarily a. a a filing for an abatement every year unless you thought every year you were overvalued. If, if you're granted the abatement and we, and we satisfy your thought that you were overvalued, then you probably wouldn't be filing for the abatement. Exemptions, you have because to file you, every year. Because you, the assessors, would keep the, the changed valuation the next year. Uh, no, no, we would, it, it's only for that particular year we would adjust the valuation and then if the market went up you would start at that base point and then go up from there instead of the pre-abated right. value okay. all right and then so that's an, an abatement and an exemption is right exemptions are uh law through the state of massachusetts so they're different under chapter 59 uh, they're different clauses that the state's the state allows each municipality to exempt a portion of your real estate taxes okay through different venues first we talked about the veterans and veterans exemption disabled veterans exemption the second would be uh, clause 17 D and that's surviving spouse that's a minor child of a deceased parent or an elderly person which the state defines as uh, over 70 years old so uh, with Sorry. some of these, yes. And then, so there, my understanding coming into this is that there are, there are pieces of your tax that you can get permission not to pay, and then there are pieces that you kind of kick down the road. That's a deferral. A deferral? A yeah, deferment? yeah okay. it's a de deferral, yes. That's a deferral, which I was gonna get to yep. uh, last. Yes, and sir. Then, no, sorry. I just wanna point out to people that um, a veteran with a service-connected disability, that can change from year to year depending on the particular ailment or problem that the person has, which is why it's necessary for you to have to submit the application every year with the latest certification from the Veterans Administration of the um, disability amount. And exemptions have to be filed every year every single year because the other statuses can also change if you're a gold star parent yeah you could die and then right the home is not the, right listed they, to a gold star every parent. single one of these exemptions you have to file every year, every every year. year. okay so then when you because every fiscal year is a different obviously a different tax year so you have to file for that fiscal year you cannot go backwards you can well i forgot to file in FY17, the filing period ends April 1st of that particular uh, tax year. Okay. And when you're moving now to talk about 17D, is that still a veteran's exemption? Nope, 17D is the surviving spouse, the minor, minor child of a deceased parent, or an elderly person. So there's two elderly or senior exemptions. Um, this is... Uh, this is the, the least, this, uh, least amount of money in this particular one because this clause prescribes no limitation of annual income. So the senior exemption has annual income limits, but this one does not. They only have whole estate limits. So you can, um, you can make more money with this exemption. However, you only get $350 instead of the senior exemption being $1,000, because on a senior exemption uh, over 70, the income limits are $20,000 single and $30,000 if it's a two-person household, two or more person household. So that's why they figure we'll, you, you will get more money with the senior exemption because you have less income. But this 17D, elderly person, there is no limit on There income? is no, no limit on annual income, but there's a limitation on how much you can have in the bank. Oh. Yeah, so if you came in and said you had $500,000 in the bank, you wouldn't be able to get these 
seventeen D okay. uh, exemptions of three hundred fifty dollars per year. And does that kind of money in the bank include like the the home value, the property value? No, it doesn't include property value. It's it's basically uh, cash in the bank. What you have in your it doesn't include your car. It doesn't hold, include the value of your home. It doesn't include um, uh, the, the clothes you have on your back or assets, furniture that you have in your house. It's it's the uh, your whole estate, real and personal holdings that you have. So stocks and bonds and uh, bank accounts. It's it, there's a little bit of an honor system here because I wouldn't know what stocks and bonds you would have. You have to show us your bank accounts. We have to have a, a statement when every <coughs> year, you know. So there is a little bit of an honor system here because I wouldn't know what stocks or bonds that you would have. How much is that exemption? Uh, Forty thousand. Oh, oh, the exemption is three hundred fifty dollars. The yeah. value of the, the bank is is forty thousand. Yeah. Stocks, bonds, and bank. Yes. I will qualify for that exemption as soon as I turn seven. So, it gets with the with the elderly person or the f clause forty one C, seventy years or, or older. This is the one I was what they call the senior exemption. Um, this is the one that has annual income and, and also whole estate um, limits. So the gross receipts um, minus the Social Security allowance. So if, if you get the majority, if, you get, if all your income comes from Social Security and it equals more than $20,000, let's say it equals $23,000, the state allows you to have an exemption of the first $4,200 of your um, social security receipts. So that drives you down under the $20,000 limit. So they do, so if you just miss by, you know, if you just get all social security or you get a portion of social security and then you have something else um, and it gets you over that $20,000 or $30,000 limit, they will exempt the first $4,000 uh, for a single and about $6,000 for a two person household. So, so it, they're trying to, to uh, obviously work with um, seniors and, and trying to keep them, usually their biggest payment is there. It's either medical expenses or, or their uh, taxes, property taxes. And uh, again, all of these have to be applied for uh, by April 1st of that uh, fiscal year. So we're in FY20. It's April 1st of 2020 that these have to be applied for. Bye. And does that one, the 41C, does that have a, a bank account or a, a kind of an estate? Yeah, limit it is, well? yeah it's 40, it's again 40,000 for single and 55,000 if married. And all of these come with um, eligibility requirements. We need to see, you know, birth certificates and stuff like that, you know. I mean, once you get in the system, we know you're not getting younger. So once we see the birth certificate and we make note of it, then, then we don't need to see the birth certificate the next year. We're just looking at the income requirements. How many of our residents, if you know this off the top of your head, apply each year for these various exemptions? All of the various exemptions, uh, with, with all of them, including uh, the CPA abatement, which is not an exemption, but it's still uh, kind of in this pack, about 125. And what's the value that hits the overlay each year with these exemptions? Uh, 20, I think last year was 20, 24, 25,000. So 150 applications yeah. translates into a $25,000 reduction in the tax bills for those people yeah. every year. Correct. That's interesting. And the mo well, the, the largest uh, group that we have is the CPA exemption, and you're only talking um, the typical CPA exemption, excuse me, yeah, CPA that abatement. The overlay. Yeah, that comes out of the overlay. The CPA exemption comes the, out of the overlay? Abatement comes out. Of, all abatements and exemptions come out of the overlay. So, That's But the CPA fair. is a surcharge. It's not a tax bill. It's not, it's it's, not part of the property tax. It's, it, the overlay comes. All, yes, all exemptions and abatements come. Oh, really? Yes, yeah. 
I they, come out of the, they come out of the Oval license. And so what is the CPA mean. abatement? The Community Preservation Act tax, right? Yeah. So if you are if you are over um, sixty, let me get my I'm kind of jumping around. So I'm sorry, John. That's okay. No. If you are over uh, sixty years old uh, as of uh, January first of the year. Excuse me. Of uh, this would be okay. So we're in FY20. So if you had to be 60 years old as of January 1st, 2019, you you can qualify for the uh, low or moderate moderate income seniors community preservation act exemption. That's what it's called. And there are uh, income guidelines that are that are fairly liberal. Um, if you're a uh, senior uh, in one person household, it's $79,350. If you're a two person household, it goes up to $90,650. So it, it's a lot of people would qualify. So that's our biggest abatement is our CPA abatement. And what does that, does that eliminate the entire CPA Tax. Surcharge, yep. on, surcharge on your bill. The entire yes. amount? The entire amount, yep. Yep. So if you look on your bill, you'll see yeah. your, you know, your property tax plus your CPA surcharge. And that comes out of the overlay? Correct. I'm very confused. That doesn't about seem that. fair that it should come out of the overlay because well, the CPC funds go into the various buckets, including unallocated. And the overlay is funded through the tax rate as part of the levy, is it not? Correct. So as a result, why does that take the hit for the exemption? Could, right. And it's, <laughs> yeah, but it just, it just it's, doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I, but, I believe you, Josh. But it's, a, it's an abatement just like if you were, if you, Josh, said that you thought your house was worth 100000 and we had you at 200000 and we granted the abatement and said, we believe you're correct. It comes out of the overlay. It comes out of the overlay. <laughs> yeah, it's an abatement. But, but why would the CPA which is a surcharge, which if it, it's not- It's still a, a tax. All taxes come so we that are abated or exempted come out so of the overlay. So we pay out of the overlay into the community preservation fund? No, we just no. abate the, the, yeah. the, the no. abatement yeah. comes out of the yeah, seat, out of the- I need to look, I'm sorry, I'm very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confused. Okay. You're way I'll beyond. Stop, I will stop talking. I understand. <laughs> and that one only has an age Restriction and an income restriction guideline? Correct, yes. No. Any age is what? 60. 60. 60. As of January 1st. Of the previous of the year. Of the previous year. Okay. And how many of those uh, applications off, uh, off the top of my head? Probably 60. And there's probably hundreds more people who qualify for that. Sure. Absolutely. Well, that's you're, why you're I'm here. Be busy to get the To get the word out. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a few other exemptions um, with the, the elderly. We have um, we did the CPA. We had, there's a blind exemption clause 37A is what the town of Groton uh, adopted, and um, the the value of that exemption is a thousand dollars. It is you need um, you need to be obviously an owner of the property in all of these you have to have an ownership stake in the property. So sometimes we run into issues with people that file um, trusts and they're not on the trust documentation. They take themselves, to, they file a trust and they're not a trustee. Well, then you don't have ownership stake in the property and that becomes a problem with exemptions. So life estates qualify because that gives you an ownership right in the property and you have to be named in the trust, so um, when there's a trust, we ask to see the trust, so we know that the person uh, is actually named as a trustee of the trust, so they can still they have ownership of the property and they can still get the exemption. So the the, um, the blind person's uh, exemption basically, you would have to have a uh, certificate from the uh, commission for the blind that says that you are. Uh, 
impaired to a point that uh, you would qualify uh, for this exemption. Um, I have had a couple of years where it does take the commission a bit of time to get these certificates. So the, the first year you can have a doctor's note basically saying that you're, you're uh, impaired and, uh, and we can use that the first year. But by the second year you have to have that, um, that certificate from the Commission for the Blind. And that one doesn't have any income or correct. Yep, just holding value. Yeah, just have to be uh, sight impaired. Um, the last one that we have is what you were talking about: the property tax deferral. Um, we probably have maybe six or so people that take advantage of this, uh, and this becomes uh, very helpful. Uh, to seniors to keep them in their house. So if they're equity rich in their home, they own their home outright, um, but the property taxes are, well, the average uh, tax bill in this town is about $8,500. So they could defer all or a portion of that, um, of those taxes uh, for as many years as they want, as long as the valuation doesn't uh, the excuse me the amount of the deferral doesn't exceed 50 percent of the fair market cash value of the home and do you place a lien on the property Correct. for that amount of money we we place a lien on the home yeah not for a specific amount of money but just just a lien that that we're always in first Tom's place first anyway. place i understand right so but we lean it so because after the the individual's passing they have six months either to pay the taxes or sell the property. And if they don't, um, uh, the interest rate goes from 8% up to 16%. So, so a deferral is at 8%? 8% simple interest. Yeah. Is, is that the same as a reverse mortgage? Or it's, it's, it has similar attributes yeah. of yeah. a reverse mortgage. But it's not done through a bank. It's Correct. done through the town. It's right. done through the town. Yeah. And it's only for people who own their houses outright without mortgages. Yes. You, now you can get. There are some people who are in the program who have mortgages, but that's the, the that's because their lender says they can do it. Okay. But the town is first, and the bank is subordinate second and last. Correct. The only time the the only time the town is not first is with a reverse mortgage. Somehow some way they were able to get in the first slot. I don't understand it, Lottos. can't explain it, but that's what I know. And so, there's no income or kind of bank account holding restrictions or requirements on that one? Yes, there is. There, you, you, yeah, for the deferral, it's very similar to the senior exemption, um, $20,000 or less per year for the uh, yeah, for the income, and um, for some, in for some reason, they don't. You can have, uh, you can have money in the bank. They, and you can defer it if you make less than twenty thousand dollars a year or thirty thousand. You can, you can still have money. They, there's not an, uh, there's not an asset qualification with a deferral. Well, I mean, that's not a bad deal at all for the. Uh person who needs the deferral because they still can live, they won't get taxed out of the town, right. and the town is in a position where it's earning 8% sure. um, ultimately when the house is sold or transferred. So. And, I, and I think the theory behind it is, you know, houses need, if with, with everybody living longer and longer, um, you're going to need some, there's going to need, need to be some cash in the bank in order to you know repair your roof or your furnace or if something happens so i think that's the thought process behind it so Good program yeah so just jonathan if if somebody applies for that deferral do you have the right to find out if there's already a reverse mortgage on it yeah so um they yeah we would it's public record, so we could look it up, which we do. And if and if we see a mortgage on the property and don't see a discharge, then we would ask them for a discharge. But if they if they have a reverse mortgage, still you, you you, would, it still would be filed. 
you would still see it in the registry of deeds. Right. I guess the, I mean, do you make some decision as to the likelihood that there will be enough money to pay back both the reverse mortgage and the deferral, or you don't give the deferral? Is that? <clears throat> well, they either qualify or they don't. So that's why you do it every year. And if you were to get to that point where you were above the 50 percent, uh, right, then you would right, not. Right. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Anything else? I have one other question. Um, just related to what we, our discussion with the water commissioners, because I believe they said that the surcharge that they're going to be adding, they're going to, the people who get their taxes abated or exempt are not going to have to pay that. That's their internal policy, so they would coordinate with Jonathan. Right. But and there's no just, legal standard that says they have to. Right. It, it strikes me that it's a more complicated situation and a I don't know if you've been working with the water commissioners, but before they start telling people what. I have had a brief conversation with Michael Hartnett, the treasurer, this morning, and we started our discussion about how we were going to be able to manage this um, issue. Okay. So I, I don't have all the answers yet because it's a new. Uh, and then I think we also have a. Uh, Stormwater coming down the line too. Yes. Yeah, which right. can be added, I believe, can be put on the tax bill. So right. those are things that we're going to have to work out. <coughs> Mark, I guess yeah. actually my thought is it's important for the water department to understand that the there are a number of different kinds of exemptions, and before they issue whatever ruling they are going to issue, they need to know which exemption. Tom Tom is familiar with that. He's working on that issue. I'm yeah, sure we've had conversations so. with him on that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've had brief conversations, yeah. So, and, I, and I'm not sure if it, I think it might produce a second, uh, doesn't the water, um, it produces a second bill for West Groton water, doesn't it? Is it yeah, yeah, so I think it might be, so, I'm not sure. West Groton water is totally different. Yeah, yeah, I know it's not, we don't, yeah, it's a private. So. And how do the work off program work? Is that only for seniors, or can that be low income, or is that? No, uh, the the uh, the work off is um, a seven hundred dollar um, work off uh, abatement on your on your taxes. One thing I want to say is, you can only get one exemption. You can't get more than one exemption. However, if you you can get an ex the difference between an exemption and an abatement. So you can get only one exemption. However, if you qualify for one of the exemptions, you can still qualify for the CPA abatement. So if, and, and if you're a senior that qualifies for the senior exemption of $1,000, you automatically get the CPA abatement. You don't have to file the, the, the documentation because you meet the criteria. So the seniors. But if they, you're blind, you could get all you three. You could of those. get yes. You could get the okay. uh, CPA abatement. Right. Yeah. Well, could Allison, say that again. Well, I I lost my train of thought. Uh, so I was asking about the work off. Yeah. So the senior work off is a uh, is an application. I think we take a maximum of twenty eight applicants, and the uh, there is no income limits set and there are no asset limits set um, however when they apply they need to uh, we confirm through their federal tax refund in their bank accounts what they have and we make a note on it and it's not of public record but we make a note on there so if we do get 40 applications we take the, the most needy and work our way forward to the 28th. And, and that's, that's the fair so way. You pay the people how much per hour? Th 13 something? It's the, I guess it's based on. Um, Patricia, was it minimum it, wage? It's the minimum wage, yeah. So you're allowed wages. to work whatever the hours are that work to $700. Yeah, so Correct. Divided by the 1275. Tells out, yeah, how many hours, yeah. 
And how many seniors do we have in that program right I now? I think we have 23, 21, program. something like that. And what yeah. is the age for that? Uh, over 60. So if anybody at home wasn't confused before exactly. they <laughs> had this meeting, they certainly yeah. can well, call, the, the, hold on, they certainly could call your office for clarification no, please, for anything that they don't understand or come down to town hall and discuss this with you if they're looking for it. Absolutely. If they have any questions that they think they're over a certain age and they think they may qualify, come down to the town hall, to the assessor's office and talk to us and we can walk them through the process. It's not hard. Obviously, we want people who qualify for these exemptions to get their exemptions and that's why I am here talking to you to get the word out that there are exemptions and you have until April 1st to file for them. I have personally personally witnessed Jonathan and Megan with the seniors and the various people that come in and they do a wonderful job explaining it to them. And so I, I agree with Jonathan, I encourage anybody with questions, hit the assessor's office. And like I said, once or twice a year, I, I uh, get with Kathy and I used to call it the senior center, but the center, and I, I went to the new center in the fall and because of that, we've probably had five new people come in uh, to get, you know, to, to file, uh, newbies to file for their various exemptions. So every time we talk, we pick up some more folks, which is what we want. These are there for them. You just have to apply for them if you qualify for them. And obviously there's no way to take all of the information and put it in a chart, but is there some way to kind of create you know, like a one-page chart that kind of lists what these are and yeah, we can age one very income. big page. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Eleven by seventeen, maybe. But. I mean, just so that folks at home potentially who aren't going to the, C, the to the center or what have you begin to have some idea of whether okay, I might qualify for these three. It's worth a phone call, or oh, never mind. You know, right. can we do some sort of kind of one-page something that's more helpful than my scribbling? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, we can. We, we can try to put something together that goes over the the, the basics of everything, and um, and then they can you know they can see. Well, it looks like right. I may qualify. Let me go down to the to the uh, to the assessor's office and and see if I actually do. Yeah. We I can put something together. Helpful. Yeah, and put it on the website. Yeah. Other questions? Great job, Jonathan. Well, it was a little it was a little convoluted, <laughs> and there are questions. There, a lot of people don't know that these exist, and so we, we want to get you know to the right people and, and yeah. get there's, them to apply. I'll see there's you in two a lot years. of. Uh, what did you I'll say? I'll see you what? I said I'll see you in two years. Two years. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a lot of, of uh, documents uh, of different colors that are available downstairs at the assessor's office that provide more information on these different categories. Right. Yeah, and that's why we kind of, uh, instead of using white paper, we, we, we color code them because it just makes it easier for us to know, oh yeah, right. the CPA is purple and we give it out, you know what I mean? And we try to keep them consistent so that people know, oh, I need the purple one or I need right. the pink one, you know? So Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. So, um, in la in your last meeting, I brought you a revised committee yes. vacancy policy. Yes. Josh had a concern. <laughs> Uh, with it, so I amended the policy again. What page you, are we on? Uh, four, it starts four. on page four in your packet. Um, if you look at paragraph three, it says if the charge of a particular committee states that a member of the committee shall be a select board member of their representative, the select board shall interview all candidates prior to making the appointment. I believe, Josh, that was the issue that you that had. Works for me, unless anybody else has an issue. Yep. With it. And then, Did we I'm think sorry. When we had talked about it, it was always select board member or their designee. Still is. <coughs> so you want me to change representative to designee? Is that what I you said? I thought it said a select board member or its designee. Where did I, that changed? He's got it written. I as said representative. representative. I think designee is the way it shows up in the charges. Okay. So I think that would be smarter for us. All right. So I can change that word to designee. <coughs> and then um, under the town manager uh, appointed nominated committee to conform with the charter. Which, by the way, the charter says for those boards, not other, uh, where there is not another appointment process designated by bylaw or in this charter, then the town manager shall nominate to the select board. 
there are two boards that I appoint. So I wanted to make sure this made sense. So I wrote not appointed slash nominated, and I added the words or accept the town manager's nomination for appointment, or accept the town manager's acceptance of the town manager's nomination. This complies with the charter and complies with the with the, uh, the way we would move forward. So I've amended the policy in those two areas as the, the original uh, change is under 4A, which we did last week. I didn't change that because you were all set with that. So based on that, I'd ask the board to adopt the revised policy. I move that we adopt the, uh, <laughs> the uh, committee vacancy policy yep. as presented uh, with the Changes this the one change the discussed change representative tonight. to designate. Uh, Sorry. And I just mm. want to point out, Mark, that yes. the date you have there, January twentieth, yeah, is not accurate. I think that accurate. needs to be included. <coughs> to avoid today's confusion. January twenty seventh, and we did not meet on January twentieth. Oh, that's a typo. I will fix that. I'll second that. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> Any further discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So um, it's that time of the year for the annual Taste of Neshoba, sponsored by the Neshoba uh, Chamber of Commerce. It will be held on Tuesday, March 24th from 5.30 day at Lawrence Academy. They've requested an all-alcohol license for the night. I'd ask the board to grant that license. We have the proper insurance certificates and they've paid the fee. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, at, the, at the request of the town clerk, I've appointed Emily Nevada, Virginia Reinapp, Michael Latours, and Carrie Bolton as election workers pursuant to section 4-23 of the Groton Charter. I would ask the board to ratify those appointments. I move that the board ratify the town manager's appointments of the four individuals as named. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'd ask the board to go to page seven in your packet where we have the second quarter uh, financial update uh, for fiscal year uh, 20. Um, this is the same format that we give you every year. I want to call your attention to a couple of areas on the uh, revenue section. Um, if you look at the local option meals tax, this time last year we were at 83,000. We are at 109,000, so that continues to be strong, and we're very pleased with that. That is, that is growing uh, each year. We budgeted 150,000 for the year for that, so we're pretty confident we're going to make that. Next year, in fiscal year 21, I'm carrying 300,000 for both the meals tax and the occupancy tax. And based on where we stand now, I'm very confident that we're going to uh, hopefully, well, I'm confident that we will meet that 300,000 uh, in the budget. You will also see that we have the uh, local room occupancy tax is also coming in uh, right about where we need it to be for this year at 50,000. So that's at 3%. So at 6%, you can assume it's gonna be 100,000, thus the, the 200,000 for next year. So we're pretty comfortable uh, with, with the way that's going. The one area that I'm very, very concerned about um, that I wanna call to your attention is in licenses and permits. It's trending down. We're $40,000 behind or $33,000 behind where we were at this time last year. And even though the number of permits is relatively the same, the value of those permits is less. So I continue to be concerned as I've been stating all along with, with licenses and permits. We should hit the 300,000 this year, but I'm really nervous about next year. Yes, Alice. I have a question on that, Mark. Please. Um, I feel like I, I ask for this frequently, and I apologize. Is it possible to insert an actual final fiscal 19, not a budget number, but an actual number for the total year so that we can begin to see, you know, the, the so last year at this point, we had collected, what, 89% of what was anticipated for licenses and permits? But well, that's all. I'm, conf I'm confused by your question. I'm sorry. The, the actual is that second column versus the budget. To date, correct. Correct, and then the actual from last year at this time is there as well. Do you want to have the full year yes. from 19? From the, so you want the full year from the previous year? Yes, next to the budget, so okay. that we can see what the budget and actual were. So you want one more, is that possible to add one more column? Do you, do you, no. do you send that electronically to them because every year is at the bottom, all you have to do 
I just give them the color quarter. Well, if, if, you, if you sent electronically the whole thing, they have every year. The spreadsheet. FY15. Okay. Well, Well, let me f well, send I'm you the sure full it's worksheet. A, that it's a it's a column issue because you replaced this July to December actual for. Oh, you know what? July, July, you know, I, well, the whole idea of this. July to June. Um, the whole idea of this was to, was to be able to compare the current second quarter with last year's second quarter. That was the whole point of this. So if, if we want to change the 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 purpose of it, we could, we could certainly do that. We could drop the the second quarter results from the previous year and put the total, I guess, if you but want. It, then we also have to drop that final percentage let, budget change. Okay, let me let me give you the full worksheet because last year when I gave you, or in August when I gave you the fourth quarter fiscal 19 update, that had the actual versus the budget. So on the spreadsheet that I'm going to send you, the full document that Patricia sends me every quarter, I just print out the current quarter that we're in. I will send you the full quarter and you will see what you're asking for on that spreadsheet. Right, and it, it, so it would be more helpful to me to see it in one spreadsheet if it's, you know, if it, logistically it's difficult either to insert it or if it pushes it off the size of the paper, that's fine. I can juggle around all these different documents that I should be able to find theoretically on my own somehow. Um, you know, to me, it, it it's great to be able to compare where we're at right now versus where we were at the same time last year. Um, where it, it, I guess what my quandary becomes is, you know, oh, we expected the meals tax last year to be 120. This year we went up to 150. What was last year actually? Was it 123 or was it 198? Well, it was actually, okay, I see. We can, uh, I'll. Yeah, and that's on the other tab. That's on the FY19 tab, which is, Maybe you know, this, this tab is FY20. So, so yeah. I mean, if you had electronically, <coughs> kind of thing, but we can, we can try to put in another, another column if you guys want to go to I'll, I'll work with Patricia and figure out how to get that to you. Okay. I, I got you. Yeah. So I like the quarter to quarter comparison. I like this spreadsheet because it shows us how we're tracking year over year. At the end of the year, you get what you're looking for. You get the full, you get to see what we budgeted and what the actual was for the full year and what the difference is. Right, but I would like to know halfway okay. through. Okay, we can do that. We can so do that. Two, two things jump out at me on the um, revenue side. Um, and I know there's good answers for them, so let's just hear them. Um, the first one is on the motor vehicle and boat excise taxes. We're tracking consistently both last year and this year at about 15% through now. Are those payments not due until a certain point? The that's big commitment, I, I sent you an email last week. The big commitment goes out next week. Next week? Yeah. The big commitment and goes out next week and it's 4% higher than last year at this time. We don't start collecting on this until right. third quarter. Yeah. So that is the answer. Correct. Yeah. And the other question would be, I know we charge for regional dispatch to Dunstable, and both last year and this year, they were tracking um, very low on how much they paid. Yeah, they pay why, us once a year at the end of the year. Why don't they pay us quarterly is my question to you. Well, we've never done it that way, but we can if you'd like. I, I don't understand. We do it 365 days a year, it sure would be a lot easier to collect from them on a quarterly basis. They used so to bill it. They used to bill it twice a year. I think they, it's possible they still do bill it twice a year, and, and they probably build it out in December. We don't get it until January. So if, you know, if you look at third quarter last year, you'd probably see it. But I mean, it's something you could ask. We could ask the police department to bill it more often, um, if you'd like. What, how often do you want it to be billed? I can ask them to bill it. Well, not daily, but certainly. Daily. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, I'll call Kathy. And Qu I think quarterly, quarterly certainly. Is I mean, we, we charge our taxpayers on a quarterly basis. I, I'm sure, I'm sure I, I Dunstable it's wouldn't it's have a problem with it. Just... That's all. I got you. Becky? So to go back to what you were saying, Mark, you said you were concerned about licenses and permits, but it shows that we've already collected 77% for, for what we are budgeting for. So why are you concerned? It's trending down. Because saying. last year at this time we had collected 85%. Correct. And anytime I see a negative trend, it causes me concern. And $300,000 is a, is, a, is a big number. Now, we've exceeded that the last couple of years because of some building, you know, like you brought in the building permit that we got from 
Indian Hill and things like that. But when I see a downward trend in revenue, I get concerned. And that's a pretty significant downward trend. But last year when you collected money um, in your permits through this period, had you not collected the additional uh, electrical or HVAC permit? I believe that came in in December or January when we finally settled that, Josh. Okay, I, I don't know when that yeah. happened. So that's not the anomaly. I don't believe so. So is there some reason that in general all the licenses and permit fees come in in the, you know, uh, that we should expect that three quarters of them come in in the first half of the year? Yeah, because over the summer is the big build, the busy building season. So you don't have winter, a lot of building in the winter months. Right, so the winter is and down. And then it picks up again in, say, April. In spring, okay. Yeah. Um, with regards to expenditures, we're tracking right where we should be. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're a little bit behind last year at this time, which is good news. Um, you know, the, the, some of the things that you see that have the higher percentages, uh, that's because we pay out the, um, the uh, pension up front. Uh, Department of Public Works, you'll see this number starting to go up a little bit more because snow and ice is in there, and you're going to see that start to climb because we're already at what? Over 50% of that we're, budget. We're at 80%. We're at 80% of snow we're and ice at, at this time. Through January. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's going up. We'll probably have to deficit spend that. But for the most part, the normal departments and the normal expenditures, especially in this line item here, public safety um, within the general fund, is tracking very nicely, which means overtime is not going too crazy, which is uh, which is helpful. Um, so overall, I'm pleased with the, with the operation. I'm pleased with the revenues, and we're tracking right where we should be. So good news all around. Just a couple of caveats that I pointed out to you. Other questions? Right here. Right here. Muttering. Snow and ice. I, I'm for public works. Yeah, but there's not a separate line item for snow and ice? It's all within the Department it's, of Public Works budget. It's in DPW. Okay, so within the DPW, um, was that snow and ice number was reduced to, for this year, was it not? If you go down to the next page, I think you'll find that it's broken out. We were carrying a different number, were we not, this year? The snow and ice? Deficit? No, no, we, you're talking about the deficit, Josh. I'm talking about this is the actual budget. The budget was $340,000. Right. And we're right now at 80% of that. And then the deficit that I carry for next year is 200, or 100 in the balance budget. And right now we're at 80% of the 340. I see. Did I say anything that wasn't no, right? Correct. No, I get can you, it. Can Thank you, you say that all again? I'm looking at page 8, and under snow and ice it says current budget fiscal 20 is 140, and final fiscal 19 budget was 160. That's, is that the overtime line? Well, because we end up bumping up the budget oh, when, we we have, when we do the deficit spending. We brought in, we brought in overlay. When you you bring brought $20,000 in the overlay last year, right? Yeah. So the final number was increased by the amount brought in from the overlay, so that's why that number's there yeah. at 160. That 140 isn't the total, that doesn't include the expenses, that's just the overtime line? Yeah, no, that's, that's just, this, this, the second page is just salaries and wages because that's, that's how what Bud likes to see. to see it. So I'm just sorry. Be careful about that, yeah, yep. it's just your, your overtime. All right. Good question, though. Um, <coughs> I'm still a little confused on the uh, dispatch. Um, I keep I keep hearing that our grant is in the two hundred and thirty thousand dollar range. Yep. It is. Um, but then I look here, and um, where are you? Are I'm, you on the? I'm on page eight. So you're uh, on the down. salary report. Because the salary piece is not 230000 The salary piece of the dispatch grant is, um, well, it was 200574 200, but only 163446 has been spent so far. Okay, so if I go to the two, the two stars at the bottom, yes. and it indicates that um, 163484 that is a portion of the two hundred and thirty. Yes. That is being applied yes. so to they, labor yes. costs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. I got it. Next year it's going to be hopefully at least 150. 
according to the budget I presented to you. Last year was 72,000 in salaries, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. So last year, the year before, it was really low. I think it might have been 18. It was 18 because you could 18. see 19 on the Oh, yeah, 19's right there. Any other questions on uh, finances? I'm very comfortable with where we are. Right. The next thing that we do is a goals review. Um, so we'll start, yeah, on the next page, starting on page 9. Uh, the first goal, of course, is the uh, select board functioning. I think that continues to go really well. Thank you, Patricia. We uh, gave you um, the spring schedule last week, and hopefully that'll get us through um, the, the town meeting. So we continue to uh, to provide those. So Mark, yep. Um, I was going to ask, could we uh, find some way to include that either in the packet every week because it changes from week to week, as like with the CPA, and uh, I think we've all, we already rescheduled what was printed last week or what was. What we received last week about Point and Meadows, and maybe you're going to address that again. I'm not sure. I was going to do that under the update. Yep. Right. I mean, maybe change the date again is what I mean. If we could just, if you could routinely give us the best guess of what the next three months look like, because it changes every week. Allison, you're looking. I just, I, I have no real issue with that. I'm not sure what the benefit is. Well, because I mean, for the benefit, I had people ask me, um, is it, are you talking with the CPA tonight? I thought I heard that it was going to be, you were talking with the CPA tonight. And I said, no, that could change. But if I were only looking at what was printed last week, I would have also been confused. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, major initiative, that goal was done. Uh, green communities designation. Um, we're still waiting for a decision from the state. I expect that decision to be uh, very positive. Uh, uh, determine the appropriate uh, levels of public safety. That goal we completed, so there's no new update on that. Select board policies. I believe we're down to three. Correct me if I'm wrong. The town manager review policy, meetings on holiday policy, and memorial parks and common policy. So we've done 54 of 57 policies. Congratulations. Yeah. And um, I had a question about that. J Josh is muttering started. Yeah, I'm muttering. Uh, I'm not so sure we've completed number four. Uh, we've completed number four. number four in so much as we have completed the things that you stated we've completed. But um, we have yet to complete um, the long-term needs moving forward once Indian Hill opens up. And um, both John and I have been discussing with both chiefs uh, a plan for the future in terms of what kind of staffing levels, what type of equipment outside of details required for events may be needed. So I still think that that needs to be left open. Well, that'll probably be on next year's goals. I know, but I just don't want to close uh, okay. this goal. That's all I'm yep. saying. I got you. We're starting to work on it now um, in small steps, um, but Tom Delaney is going to be part of it also because yes. uh, when I go through uh, the conditions uh, for the Indian Hill permit, um, there are many things that have to do with traffic and, and roads and streets that um, Tom has to oversee to make sure that we're getting what they are supposed to do. Okay. So we need to tie him into that so that it all melts. So fire, highway, roads, crosswalks, all fit together. We had stated that after the um, budget meeting we had with the Finance Committee, which occurred last week and which will continue a week from Saturday, that we would get together uh, with everyone again and continue the process. So I would expect and hope that at some point, certainly not for this budget cycle because it won't impact it at all, but um, by the end of the summer, we should have that completed. John, okay. does that sound about right, hopefully? Yeah. John's uh, we should, what, no, we should be able to. I don't think we need another six to eight months on that. I mean, it, it's got to have follow through because 
then you're going to oversee the construction and make sure, you know, and, and so forth. But the plan, the plan, I, I think we can do in that time frame. Um, Becky, so did you have a question yes, on the policies? Policies. So, policies. Um, so, uh, could we get all the 54 that we've done posted on the website now? I, I, you know something? Yeah, why don't I send those 54 to eCode and have those done? Right away. I'll talk to Mike and Charlotte. I mean, I don't see any benefit in waiting until we get them all done. Okay, I, I was waiting, but you're right. No, no sense in waiting. Yeah. So you can stick a, a sheet in where the three are that aren't finished that says under under review. Yep. Um, and then they're all accounted for for what their state is. I'm not sure at this point for the meetings on holiday policy that was on hold looking to the Yes, they're meeting as we sit here. They are sitting there meeting um, okay. to hopefully get you the answers that you're okay. asking. And, and we're referring to the interfaith council. Yes, that was the word I was looking to you for. I needed a minute to. Um, okay, so yeah, if they come through with something, then we can do that. If not, we may have to either create our own list, which feels somewhat dangerous, or not have a list. I agree that's dangerous. <laughs> and I know you, Becky's working, working really hard on that one. Um, yeah, Don Black and I have had conversation, and we're moving that along. Okay, um, I will get going on that. Uh, operating budget at the town and the school districts, I don't think I need to talk about that. We'll talk about that in coming Saturdays. We're working with the finance committee moving forward. Housing alternatives, I said that this goal was replaced by goal number nine, the housing production plan uh, implementation, so that's where we are. Um, and related yep. to that, the Affordable Housing Trust is meeting later this week. Um, and so if there is going to be any rescheduling, it, if, if we're not going to stick with the February 24th date for that joint meeting, it would be helpful to know before this Thursday. So I'll, I'll, talk to Fran, I'll talk to Fran tomorrow. Um, we I, spoke about that earlier. Today. We did, yeah, okay. because Josh is, uh, is unavailable on the night of the 24th. Right. It didn't make sense to have that meeting without right. Josh. So I'll talk to Fran tomorrow. I think it has to push off to yep. the, uh, the next week, the first week of March. All right, um, IT uh, efficiency. Um, that goal was uh, that goal was completed. Now we're into the actual implementation. Patricia is the software has been upgraded, and Patricia is working with various departments to get them in line with presenting and things like that. So that's going uh, that's going really well. Um, the housing production plan. Um, we're waiting for completion of the housing production plan, and then we'll schedule a workshop as soon as we get it. It should be any day now, or any weekend. John. I have a quick question because I've heard that it's going to be a meeting of the Community Preservation Committee and the Select Board. But now I'm reading something about a representative from the Community Preservation Coalition. I'm, I'm confused with what you're asking. You, you, you're ahead, you're ahead, ahead. Go. You just jumped into the oh, next you're on number one. 10? You went to the next one. I'm on the, the last one. I haven't talked about the next one yet. Okay. I was talking about number nine. Okay. Which is we're waiting for the housing production plan. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Community Preservation Act on whether or not we're going to move forward with it, the first step is a meeting between this board and the CPC, which will take place next week. And then after that, we'll decide whether or not we're bringing in somebody from the state to further the discussion. But I think we wanted to have the first discussion locally before we talk to the state. Is that, am I missing something on that? Was that the, I thought that was what we talked about. But if John's memory is different, I want to make sure I'm doing no, the right I'm thing. No, I'm trying to understand um, Community Preservation Coalition is something at the state level. Yep. And this is the one where we had some minor discussion around whether um, we used someone who was a member of our CPC. Oh, correct. And also on this committee or whether we'd yes. be better off to bring somebody in um, who is not tied yes. into both organizations. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. after next week's meeting. I just meeting. didn't have the name of this, yeah. this I guess Boston group. So goals continue to be well done. So thank you, Boyd. You're doing a great job on the goals. <coughs> thank you. Um, back to my town manager's report.
Um, in preparing the agenda for this meeting, I noticed that we were due for an executive session minute review. And because we've only had one executive session since the last review on November 18th, there really wasn't anything to review. So we'll wait till the next quarter. But I just wanted to make sure, usually I get a, a, a memo from the clerk telling me to put it on. I was, I was ahead of you this time, John. I didn't give it to you because we only had one. <laughs> But I think, we want awesome. the, I think we want the minutes to show that indeed right. we know, and yes, know that's why I did that. That's why I put that uh, on. Decided that they're so the board's in agreement on that one, right? Yes. All right. I'm just spacing out a little bit here. So that executive session, we, we don't approve the meetings of executive session in open session, right? Nope, you do that in executive session. Okay. So that's where we are with that. Any questions? And then as is our practice during budget season, I set aside time on the agenda. I just wanted to talk about a couple of things based on Saturday's uh, joint meeting uh, for the public and for everybody else. Uh, I thought the, the meeting went extremely well. I was extremely pleased with our department heads. I thought they came into the meeting fully prepared to discuss the issues. I thought the, plan, uh, the finance committee and the select board really were, were great with the questions that they asked and the follow through. And I'm very pleased with, with, with the overall meeting. I thought it was a great meeting. I'm looking forward to the next meeting, which for the public's information is going to be on Saturday, February 8th, beginning at 8.30 in this room here. We'll move the meeting upstairs. Uh, and the purpose of that is for the select board and the finance committee to roll up their sleeves and really get into the budget numbers and look at long-term projections and things like that and decide where we're going. One of the things that came up Saturday that I wanted to talk to you about today was an idea that I had presented potentially of paying off the sewer debt prior to uh, giving the money up front to the sewer commission if we can grapple together or cobble together, grapple, cobble together the money uh, to get it off the budget once and for all. It's actually one more year than I thought on Saturday. So that puts the number over $122,000. I will continue to look at a way to try to do that, but I'm not sure if I can. But I just want to let the board know that we are looking into it. We're trying to figure out exactly how to address that. But Yes. But if we can't do it all, I think we should do what we can. That's the board's decision and the FinCom's decision, absolutely. Whatever you guys decide is what we do. But I just wanted to make sure you had all that uh, information. Were there any questions that the board had uh, based on Saturday's meeting? Which, the great thing about that is everybody was there from all boards. Full select board, full finance committee. That was awesome. So, any um, any questions since that time that you've come up with? Patricia and I are here to answer them. All right, February 8th at um, 8.30. 8.30 here in this room. Um, going back to the ongoing issues list, uh, unless there's any, I don't think there's any other business, right? So going to the ongoing issues list, I want to thank the town accountant because I had developed a form that I was going to give you on the first update, which is the senior center uh, closeout in the budget. And I was so proud of my form. And I said, Patricia, let's go over this. And she goes, look at this. I'm like, wow, this form is so much better. So I'm going to hand to you a document that Patricia put together. And I want you to go to the final page, because that's the page that matters. The first several pages is every invoice that was paid on the project. So you have a complete list of every bill that was paid on, this, on the senior center. The final page, though, on the bottom is the key. And if you look at the middle column, you will see that the original bond authorization for the project was 5,431,000. That's what town meeting approved. We set on the bond and what we borrowed was $5,342,328, which was $80,000 less than the town meeting authorized. Now, you say, well, why did you do it that way? Well, we didn't do it on purpose. It was a mistake in the numbers when the bond got, got issued. We still had the authorization, but what we said at the time is, why borrow the extra 80 if we don't need to borrow it? We had the authorization, but we only bonded 5.3. And this is the short-term bonding? No, no, this is a permanent financing of the project. Exactly. Permanent financing of the project. But to offset that 80,000, we got 15,000 gift from the Lawrence Academy, and we got a $92,000 grant from the state for the, for the boiler. So that offset the 80,000 that we didn't get. At the end of the day, the project as it sits now, we came in $40,000 under the town meeting appropriation, and the project is completed. There might be one or two bills out there that we may have to charge to this, but the bottom, that won't be more than $15,000. But the bottom line is, 
this project came in under budget. And we bonded $80,000 less than town meeting authorized, so that's a benefit to the taxpayers. And now, since there's $40,000 less, and it's less than $50,000, as you remember in my budget, I asked you for permission, I'm gonna ask you to take $24,000 in bond proceeds from former projects and use that to pay down debt service for excluded debt. You know that's part of my budget presentation. Next year, I'm going to come to you and ask you to take that $40,000 and use it to pay down excluded debt service, which is a benefit to the taxpayers. So not only did we borrow less than we were authorized to borrow, we're gonna use what's left over to even lower excluded debt next year as well. All in all, great news. That's a, a lot of information. Um, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I was excited I'm, about that information. I can tell. <laughs> and that's great. I'm having trouble tonight following th these monetary things. Okay. Um, I so, apologize. So the amount authorized by town meeting was the 5431. Five, one. One. Yep. And the total amount we ended up spending, regardless of what was or wasn't budgeted, funded, bonded, yep. was what? Uh, five million. 858,580 on the entire project. If you look at the first column. So that includes the 450 that was authorized yes, for design, correct? Yes, that gives you the, the total project, Allison, was $5.858 million. At the end of the day, we spent $40,000 less than that number. Uh, I thought we got a bond premium reduction <coughs> when we went out to bond. Yeah, that's the two hundred and twelve thousand three twenty-eight. You see the bond proceeds oh, that was used okay, towards okay. it. For, for uses. I didn't Correct. understand that. Yep. That was that extra premium that they gave. Correct. Us, the which reduction. was which was excellent. Yeah. So the total amount of bond proceeds yeah. toward the project was five point three four two million dollars. Yes, bond. I see. So we use that two hundred and twelve thousand dollars. Correct. That oh, they absolutely. Gave us to reduce the amount of the bond received. Correct. Towards the project. Yes. Yes. So again, I apologize. Four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for design. Yep. Plus the the authorization for construction. Yep. Totals up five million eight hundred eighty-one thousand dollars. Well, plus the gift and the grant that we received as well. There's the fifteen thousand from Lawrence Academy. Correct. Understood, yep. but that's not what was authorized. The author the authorized amount to spend was five million four hundred thirty-one thousand for the construction. But Understood. We Plus had already 450 for design. Correct. So that's 5881. Yep. The total amount spent? The total amount spent on the project is 5858580, less the 92,000 state grant, less the 15,000, less the design. So funded through debt is $5,301,580. But the town meeting authorized five million four hundred and thirty-one thousand, and we didn't spend that. We spent five million three hundred and one thousand. Understood. So we came in. The final number came in about twenty-five thousand less than was authorized, but then because of the grants and the gift, yep, it ended up being significantly less. Correct. Okay. So I'm very excited about this project. And was, did the design come in at 450? Uh, the design actually came in a little bit less than no, 450. We spent 450. Oh, we spent 450, yep. okay, yes, we spent 450. Okay. Now I understand your enthusiasm. Did we receive I'm any glad you're money? happy, because I'm happy too. Did we receive any money in addition to Oh, that? let me point that out, excellent point, Josh. It's, how do you know what I'm gonna say? It's well, you asked if you get any more money in gifts. Yes. Yeah, I know what you're gonna say. We've been working together a long time. I know how your mind operates. We've got a $100,000 gift. That is not here part of the project. That $100,000, as I told the board when we received the gift, we are gonna use it in subsequent years to pay down the debt. But I didn't have to do that in year one or year two, or we won't have to do that in year two because we had 24,000 in bond proceeds that I already designated. And then next year, I'll use whatever's left of this 40000 to offset it. And then in years after that, we'll dip into that 100000 to pay down debt service. So, I'm sorry, $100,000 with 
collected in gifts? We received a gift. That was one gifts. gift? One, well, that's all the gifts that they collected, and then they handed me one check for 100 Okay, but this was the fundraising that Correct. the Senior Center Building Committee Correct. did, and they got a total of 100000 That's yep. a lot of money. Right, and now what you're saying is we will be using that to pay down the debt? So so say the debt service for the Senior Center is $400,000 a year. Right. I don't know the exact number. This year we're using $24,000 in form of project bond proceeds to lower that. Right. Next year we'll use whatever's left here to lower that. Right. And then I'll take the 100000 so it will be smooth over at least the next eight years. So that those gifts were not... The people who gave money were not expecting to be paying for extras in the senior center that wouldn't be covered under? We did not. When they did the fundraising, the project was the project. People that donated the money was to help offset the total cost of the project as presented to the okay. taxpayers. So that was the, that was the uh, plan. I think it was a good plan. They actually gave you a choice when you made the donation. There was a couple of boxes, if I remember correctly, what you wanted it to go into. So what were the other choices? Um, there was some equipment. Yep, they could purchase was, equipment. It was yep. towards the building itself, and it was towards some of the, to fund some of the activities. The programs. Yeah. yeah. But so, if you checked those others to, to fund the programs or the extras, that didn't That didn't come as part of 100000 They, they, they actually see. got more than 100000 Oh, they got a lot I more than 100000 They are okay. managing the rest of it. All right, I just want to The people, sure. uh, the, there was a lot of generosity Towards the, towards the thing. As a matter of fact, they got one grant from uh, River Court um, for $100,000 yeah. that was spent, that would be uh, spread out over four or five years for the speaker program that they're doing. Right. So those are the, t that's what John's talking about. Right. There was some grant money given for the art exhibit that, right. that you see there, but that 100000 was specifically to offset the cost of the construction. Okay. Thank you. So I'm very happy about this, as, I, as I've said a thousand times. I'll stop talking. John, um, where does the cost of the generator show up? That's that ninety-two thousand dollars, and we paid Nelco for that. But that ninety-two thousand dollars is the generator grant, and then one of the, I believe the August bill from Nelco contained the line item in there for ninety-two thousand dollars for the generator. Yeah, but, well, I thought Geld was getting involved in different project. Pay for this. Different project. You're thinking about the DPW. All right. Okay. Yeah. This is the senior center. All right. Okay. Um, it's getting late. I, <laughs> I know you gave us this, and I'm going to look at this a little harder, but I see a $850 charge for picking up a grand piano, but I don't see a line item for a grand piano. There was a grand piano that was donated to the center free of charge. That grand piano that you see in the, the yeah. meeting room, that was donated, but we had to get it to the center. I'm just, that's why I asked. Yep. And the other thing I don't see, and I imagine it's probably lumped in with fitness equipment, is the pool table. The pool table is, no, there was a line item for that because that was, uh, Patricia, do you remember when that was? Oh, well, but maybe yeah, that was. The install of the first table. I, 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 I remember which. Um, this yeah. is my first which take which at this, okay? Which vendor we got was that paid for maybe by some of the fundraising? No, projects? that was paid for out of the project. Well, there's a pool table install yep. item here on the first page. But I, per, but I don't interpret that to mean the cost of the table. Right. No, the pool table is in there. Um, I'll go through it more. You'll see it. Well, that's why I wanted to give you every invoice so you can see exactly where the money was spent on the project. So I thank Patricia for doing this. This is excellent. Yeah. No, it's very good. Any other questions on that? I'm going to take this off our ongoing issues list because we have now, that's completed. Um, Prescott School, any other questions before I move on? Okay. Prescott School Sprinkler System Project. Um, we, we're working, as I said last week, nothing's changed on that. Water Department Manganese, no update. MS4 permit, the um, committee is holding their public hearing on um, February 4th with a continuation of February 18th, and then they'll be before you on February 24th to update you on that project. Uh, polystyrene containers, the Board of Health is working on that. That's ongoing. The green communities. Um, do we think yep. that they're 
going to be ready with a article for town meeting? I'll know on February 21st. I haven't heard otherwise, but I'll, I'll try to find out, Becky. Um, green communities application and implementation. As again, I'm, I'm expecting good news any day now. Uh, Florence Roach Elementary School feasibility study. The building committee tomorrow night is going to approve a plan that gets submitted to the Mass School Building Assistance Board that shows where they are focusing on the alternatives and the overall plan on how we're going to go about doing that review. It's a very important step in the, pro in the, in the process. From there, that's when you roll up your sleeves and you really get into the nitty gritty of the project. So tomorrow is a tomorrow night is a huge milestone. That report is due to the state on February fourth. February fourth. Yeah. yeah. So February fourth, it has to be filed with the state. The building committee is going to approve that plan tomorrow with the alternatives. I'll give the board an update next week on what the final alternatives were once the committee votes them. And then, as I said, you get into the nitty gritty of rolling up your sleeves on the overall project. So this is, the public really needs to start paying attention to this project because now it's getting very serious. And we at the building committee level need to start making sure that that information is available yes. in a coherent fashion. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Yep. So that is going very, very well. Um, library roof repair. Uh, they are in punch list, and that project is just about completed. Very excited about the overall. And uh, somebody, was it John Ellenberger that does the, uh, yeah. Drone? Yeah, the drone? He posted some pictures online which were phenomenal of the, of the project. And if you look at the, at the non-slate area where all the generators and the HVAC equipment are and the copper and all the work that they did there, it's a phenomenal project. I mean, the town should be very, very proud. Of the, of the completed project. It's to the, his, it's to the history of the building, and it really came out fantastic. Um, the library trustees did a great job overseeing that project, along with our clerk of the works and OPM Bob Garside. It really came out, and, and Greenwood Industries um, did a great job as the contractor on that. Um, with regard to the highway garage renovations, um, tomorrow is the final meeting uh, that I'm going to have a uh, building construction meeting because the main building is in punch list and the um, garage, the floor has been poured and all that's left in there is to install the lights and the sprinkler system. And then that will be done as well. The highway department should be ready to move into their old building at the end of this week. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, the, the main building will be able to move their uh, trucks into that garage. The only outstanding issue is the generator that John asked about earlier. That was on it. That was a 24 week lead time to get that once it was submitted for audit. It's due to be delivered on mid March. And final paving in the spring. Final paving in the spring, yep. So that project is, as well as Greenwood did on the library roof, Construction Dynamics did on that. We were very fortunate that they were the contractor. Easiest construction project I've ever managed in my 35 years in municipal government. They did a great job. Will we get a similar accounting to that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I was down, Patricia and I went over a preliminary one today. I was down there the other day with Tom Delaney and went for a tour. And very impressive, very thorough um, utilitarian building that doesn't have things we don't need and has everything we do need to comply with OSHA standards and uh, it's going to serve the town a long time into the future. And I think it's going to save us money, especially having partially heated garages uh, with equipment in them in the long run as opposed to them sitting in the cold. It really will make a difference. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're impressed with that. It's really good. Any other board member that wants to come down and take a tour, let me know. I'll be more than happy to get you down there and see it. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great, great project. Um, I have no update on Pepperell, and that's all I have. Thank you. Do we have any liaison reports? <coughs> um. All right. Um, and then we have one set of minutes from January 13th regular meeting. Does anyone have any corrections? Or? Oh, you know what? For liaison, I should just remind everybody the nonprofit council's meeting on Friday morning. I know it's in conflict with the Neshoba Tech breakfast. 
but um, any of you are welcome to come, 9 to 10.30. Let me move that we approve the regular session meeting minutes of January 13th, 2020 as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, Noah.